Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Let me pray. We'll get going. Father, thanks for, again, our time together uh, for these chapters we're going to look at tonight that are so very precious to us as those who love and follow Jesus. Would you bless us and speak to us, please? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, John 18 is where we're going to begin. And we'll do three chapters tonight, 18, 19, and 20, and we can, we can go through three chapters uh, because it's all narrative. It's all historical accounts of what took place uh, here at the end of Jesus' life. Next Wednesday is our last one together in the Gospel of John. Uh, we will take a break for the holidays and end of the new year and then sometime in the spring, we'll come back together and do another study on something. Uh, haven't even thought about that yet. So we've got one more after tonight, uh, but tonight we'll do 18, 19, and 20. Uh, the, these three chapters contain 17 separate vignettes, little self-contained accounts of what happens here in the really the last 24 hours or so of Jesus' life. This is what's called the passion narrative of the gospel accounts. Uh, it's the record of the arrest, the trials, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's called the passion narrative. John's, to no surprise, if you've been with us uh, for the last... 15 weeks uh, through John. John's account of it is unique in some ways. It's different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, here's a few things that are unique. Uh, Jesus will appear before Annas, uh, the, one of the high priests. Uh, no other gospel writer records uh, Jesus before Annas. Uh, John will cover the Roman trial before Pilate with the most detail. The other gospel accounts mention Pilate, uh, John gives us their conversation and how hard this was for Pilate, the governor. Um, John does not include the account of the formal Jewish trial before Caiaphas, one of the high priests. The other gospel writers certainly include Caiaphas. Uh, Caiaphas is mentioned, but he, uh, we don't get an account of what's happening there in that specific trial. And then John has an emphasis and, and you'll notice it multiple times that all of these events that happen to Jesus are to fulfill prophecy. Uh, that all of them are designed to point us once again to the fact Jesus really is who he said he was. So, uh, let's go to chapter 18. Let's read the first 11 verses. When Jesus had spoken these words, now he's just ended the high priestly prayer from verse 17, so that's the words. He went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to, fill, was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So let's just walk through these verses together. Verse 4, knowing what would happen to him. So again, this is divine foreknowledge. This is Jesus uh, his divi divinity is shining through. Uh, he knows what's about to take place. He knows his Old Testament well. He knows that he's going to be betrayed. But again, he knows things in advance 
that the only way he could know those things is because he's God in the flesh. And when he encountered the Samaritan woman at the well uh, and knew that she had had five husbands, how did he know that? Uh, She didn't divulge that information to him. Uh, He just gave that information. So he's done this a number of times. It's happening here again. So the Judas and the soldiers, they come to arrest Jesus. So Jesus just steps up and who are you here for? Well, we're looking for Jesus. Now, uh, they may not know which one he is. Judas certainly does, but the rest of the, th- this crew may not know uh, who Jesus is from the rest of them. Uh, we're looking for Jesus, and then he responds, I am he. Now, we've encountered that phrase before, I am he. Uh, in the original language, it's just I am. It's the divine declaration. So, you know, throughout John, we've looked at the seven predicate I am statements. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the vine. And, and there are seven absolute I am statements. This is the seventh and final one, where Jesus flat out declares, I am, which explains why they respond the way that they do, because isn't it weird? So on the surface level, it looks like Jesus is just answering their question. Well, that's me. I'm Jesus. You're here to see me. And then they all fall down and pass out. Well, that's not a normal reaction to what Jesus says except for the fact that, and I I have these verses in front of you all the way from Ezekiel to Revelation, falling to the ground is a common reaction to divine revelation. When someone encounters God personally and something new about him is revealed, a very common reaction is to fall to the ground. So that's what happens to these. They're so overwhelmed at the reality of what Jesus has just said. Uh, God has shined through. They fall to the ground. Uh, and it, it, it comes in a triad here. He's, it's mentioned three times in the text. Uh, verse 10, um, Simon Peter, we got to love Peter. Again, you just love Peter because uh, you, you just shake your head at Peter. Like, you moron. Uh, and he runs his mouth. He doesn't have a verbal filter. Apparently, he has no self-control whatsoever. He's carrying a sword. Very common. Uh, n- not a big deal for that to be taking place. Uh, though if you, I mean, if, you, if you wanted to get into it, the kind of sword that he would have had was a short little uh, thing that was made for stabbing, not for slicing. So likely Peter meant to stab him in the face and missed uh, and, and took his ear off. So <laughs> I don't know what you do with Peter. It's just, uh, it, it's, and it's getting ready to get worse for Peter here in, in a little bit. We like what happens in chapter 21 that we'll look at next week with Peter, but uh, up until then, he's just a goofball. Uh, only John records the name of the servant who had his ear cut off. Uh, the, some of the other gospels talk about it. John tells us his name. His name is Malchus. Uh, and Luke records that Jesus immediately healed the man's ear. So he's, he's not left earless uh, the rest of his life. Jesus heals him there. Uh, notice verse 11. Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup? that the Father has given to me. Uh, This is the language uh, of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me. Well, what's the cup? Uh, The cup is symbolic of death. It is symbolic of God's wrath uh, on the sin that he's going to take on himself, of humanity's sin. That's the cup. And I've put all those verses there for you that that talk about uh, that very symbol. And notice the the last phrase, the cup that the Father has given me. So who's in charge? It's not the soldiers. It's not Judas. It's not the high priest that sent the soldiers, exactly. God is the one orchestrating even the death of his son. This is God's will that Jesus go to the cross. God is the one who's at work. Again, we, we looked at it last week and the week before, Jesus is not under the the control of Satan. He's not under uh, anybody else's control except for the Father who's giving him this cup. This is what you are to do. You are to go to the cross. Let's go to verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. 
It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who've heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. All right, let's walk through this one. There's a handful of things here to take note of. Um, verse 13, Annas. Again, this is a unique uh, account with uh, the Gospel of John, Annas, the high priest. Now, under Roman rule, there were three wealthy families that essentially shared the role of high priest. It was very political. It wasn't really a religious role, though it was highly politicized. Uh, Annas is the patriarch of one of those three families. So Annas holds the title of high priest. Five of his sons will serve as high priest and a son-in-law. The son-in-law is Caiaphas himself. Caiaphas holds the office for 18 years. He is the longest serving high priest in the entire first century. So he's very powerful, very influential, very well connected, uh, very involved politically even with Rome. Uh, so Caiaphas is a big deal, Annas even more so, because he's, he's daddy. He's, he's the big guy in charge. So even after Annas didn't hold the role anymore and his sons and son-in-law did, he still held power over that office as the patriarch of the family. Uh, so he's still referred to as the high priest. Even though that year Caiaphas is technically the high priest, Annas is still referred to by that title because he's the boss. He gets to still have that title. So when it says um, in verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus, that's Annas who's questioning him. Uh, he'll get to Caiaphas later. Uh, verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That's John. Remember, John is very self-effacing and never refers to himself by name. And, uh, in fact, we'll, we'll come to th this phrase again, and it's even uh, humorous, I think, when, we'll, when we get to it. Uh, so John's, he, he's there as well. Um, and there's uh, this little thing that's happening in verse 17 that it might be nothing it might be something and, and I'll be honest with you I've, I've never seen anyone who who brought it out before um, so which, which means that likely there's nothing to it uh, because if if it's unique to me just discount it um, <laughs> so they go into the courtyard John who's known to the high priest officers and everything John gets to go in Peter's out at the door well, John sends the servant girl out to Peter so that he can come in. But notice what she says to him in verse 17. You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? It's that word also that throws me. Could it be that John denied him too? That when he walks in, did she ask him, are you one of his disciples? Otherwise, why would she say, are you one also? So maybe Peter is not the only one that denied him. He, he's the only one who denied him three times, but maybe John is, is also not that courageous either uh, because his life is at stake 
in these moments. Um, in fact, she will say the same thing again uh, later uh, in verse 25. You are also not one of his disciples, are you? Uh, so again, maybe, maybe nothing. Maybe John held true, but uh, maybe. Um, he, he understood what was at risk here because again, verse 19 the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples. He's, he's wanting to know who's with you. Who, who are your followers? He's, he's wanting a, a, a list of names there. So John's not stupid. He knows that their uh, life is at risk. We'll uh, see later they're behind locked doors. Uh, even at Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, they're still behind locked doors in Acts chapter 2 because they're afraid that they're going to kill them too. Uh, verse 20 um, you know, I've said nothing in secret. I've spoken openly to the world. Uh, you know, if you, you want to know what I've taught, go ask people who've listened to me. Why is he telling them this? Because he wants Annas to know there is no conspiracy here. There's nothing happening behind closed doors. There's, there's no secret teachings that, that the entire public isn't aware of. We're not trying to overthrow Rome. You know, we're, we're not, we're not, you know, doing all these crimes, committing these things. Uh, there, there's nothing done that's in secret. And if, the, if you want to know anything about my teaching, just go ask the public because that's where I do my teaching. So there's built-in accountability there. Uh, verse 27, uh, as soon as Peter denies him a third time, at once the rooster crowed. That's a fulfillment of chapter 13, verse 38, where Jesus said, you will deny me before the rooster crows three times. You'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. Uh, verse 28. Then they led uh, Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. So again, we don't, we don't get to hear what happens with Caiaphas. Uh, and it was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. So they dodged the question. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this, from this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So Pilate was appointed to his role as governor of Judea. So the whole region, remember, Rome occupies uh, this whole area. There is no national Israel uh, at this time. They're, they're ruled by the Romans. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that on Sunday as we end Daniel, all the different powers that come in and rule uh, this region, the area that now is known as Israel. He was appointed to his role by Emperor Tiberius, the, the Roman emperor, uh, the most powerful man in the world. He reigned for 10 years, 26 to 36 AD. Um, you, Pilate doesn't necessarily want to get involved. You can tell. Uh, you, you take him. You, you go do your thing. Um, you, you got your own Jewish laws you know, that you guys govern yourselves with. That's fine. Uh, Pilate's job was to make sure they weren't revolting against Rome. That's all he cared about, is the threat to Rome. He doesn't care about Jews, doesn't care about Jewish law. Um, and at some point, the Romans, this is verse 31, the Romans had revoked uh, the Sanhedrin, the, which is the, the 71 Jewish rulers who, they were the, the Supreme Court of, of the Jews. Uh, the, the Romans revoked their right 
uh, towards capital punishment. So the Jews couldn't kill anybody on their own. They couldn't do this. So they have to go to Pilate. They have to uh, appeal to him. If they want Jesus killed, they cannot do it. Uh, they've charged him with blasphemy. That's the Jewish crime uh, because he's claimed to be God in the flesh. And they'll say that to Pilate here in a little bit. Uh, Pilate doesn't care about that uh, at all. Um, he doesn't want to deal with, with these things. In fact, it, it will say even uh, later, verse 32, uh, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show what kind of death he was going to die. Um, if the Jews would have killed him for blasphemy, they would have stoned him to death. They would not have crucified. The Jews didn't crucify. Uh, that was a horrific, defiling, unclean, cursed way to die. The Old Testament says uh, those who are hung on a tree are cursed. Those who are hung by the neck are, are cursed. Uh, so they don't, they don't want to do that to uh, certainly to fellow Jews. So they, they didn't crucify. They stoned uh, to death. The Romans crucified. They didn't stone anybody to death uh, because crucifixion was a far more ghastly, horrific, painful, torturous way to die, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So um, he, the only way for him to be crucified is if the Romans charge him. So Pilate doesn't care about their Jewish laws of blasphemy, so they have to come up with a political crime that Jesus has committed, and the one that they choose is treason. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. There's the blasphemy. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all, unless it had been given to you from above. You gotta love that quiet confidence there. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. What a cowardly political way to go. Uh, they can't uh, get him where they want him to go with their Jewish laws, so they uh, trump up these false political charges. He's made himself to be a king, which makes him a threat to Rome. Pilate, now you have to step in. He's appointed himself king. We don't know this king. Now Caesar needs to do something about this. That's why you're here. You need to kill him. And that's exactly what takes place. Uh, back to uh, 18, uh, verse 33. Pilate entered his headquarters, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate's assessing the threat. What's really going on here? Have they appointed you king? Have you appointed yourself? What's happening? Is this really going to be a problem for Rome or not? That's all Pilate cares about. And they have this conversation back and forth. My kingdom's not of this world. I'm here to bear witness to the truth. And then 38, the famous question from Pilate, What is truth? Quite an ironic question to ask Jesus, who said in John 14, 6, that he is truth. 
So he asks, what is truth to truth? This is John's use of irony. We'll see this a few times here in these last chapters that he would ask such a ridiculous question. And Pilate, as you could hear, Pilate does not want to kill Jesus. He tries to exonerate him three separate times. 18 verse 38 and chapter 19 verse 4 and verse 6. Three times he says, I find no fault in him. I find no guilt in him. He's done nothing wrong. Why would John uniquely include that in his gospel when the other gospel writers don't do that? Because John has set up a courtroom. We've seen it from the very beginning, the courtroom motif. He's trying to declare Jesus innocent and the world guilty. And now you've got part of the world, you've got a Gentile, pagan, Roman governor, even an outsider saying, Jesus is innocent. He did nothing. This is on the Jews, not anybody else. This is not the Romans' fault. So again, this, this fits very much with John's purpose uh, behind his gospel with trying to declare who's innocent and who's guilty. We'll see that even more here in a little bit. Uh, verse 40, they cry out, uh, don't release Jesus every year. They release, Pilate releases one of the Jewish prisoners. They want Barabbas. Um, now, combined with the other gospel accounts, Barabbas is a robber. He is an insurrectionist. He's the true threat to Rome, and he's a murderer, according to the gospel accounts. So this is, this is not a good man. This is not someone you want out on the streets. This isn't somebody you want on the playground playing kickball with your kids. Uh, this is a bad man. They want him in the name of getting Jesus killed. There's some irony here. Barabbas, his name, Bar-Abbas. Bar means son of. Uh, earlier, several chapters before, Jesus refers to uh, Peter as Simon Bar-Jonah. It means Simon the son of Jonah. So Bar-Abbas is son of the father, Abba. So the son of the father is released while the unique son of the father is crucified. Play on words. This is John continuing to uh, do a fun little thing for us uh, that we, we love. But th this thing with Barabbas is, is horrific. The, the, the guilty one goes free while the innocent one goes to the place of death. Friends, that is the gospel. The innocent die and the guilty go free. That's your story. That's mine. You're guilty. Before God, you deserve eternal death. Jesus took your death and you got declared innocent. What happened to Barabbas is what happened to you and it's what happened to me. All right, let's go back to chapter 19. Let's skip down uh, the end of verse 16. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an ins inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near their city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So verse 17, he carries his own cross. 
Uh, Matthew 27 tells us that he did indeed carry his own cross until the weight of it is just a cross beam uh, of a cross. It's not the, the, the vertical shaft, it's the horizontal one. They would strap that to the shoulders and it was part of the punishment to carry that uh, from the place you were condemned to the place you were to be crucified. Uh, he doesn't make it. He's already too weakened from the beating and he collapses and they choose Simon of Cyrene from the crowd and Simon will carry the cross the rest of the way for him. They go to Golgotha. That's a scary name, isn't it? The place of the skull. Uh, there's, there's some darkness to all of that. Uh, the Latin word for Golgotha is Calvary. That's where we get Calvary. Uh, that, you know, the, the cross of Calvary and all those songs that sing of Calvary, it's because it's the Latin word for where he was crucified. Uh, verse 18 uh, they crucified him with the, you know, the two thieves on either side. This is the only mention John gives. The other gospel writers give us more detail of what happens to them. And you know, one of them is, is saved that day, cries out, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, you'll be with me today in paradise. And that whole great event. Uh, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Psalm twenty-two sixteen, 16 and Isaiah 53, 12. Uh, both of which refer to Jesus being uh, the Messiah being placed amongst criminals. Uh, so Psalm twenty two sixteen, 16, Isaiah 53, 12. And then Pilate puts up this sign. I preached a sermon on this once out at a week of church camp. Uh, he puts up this sign uh, for the world to see. Jesus is king of the Jews. Uh, he puts it in um, three languages, uh, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Aramaic was the daily language uh, that they spoke in the region. In fact, there are a handful of uh, phrases and statements in the New Testament that are Aramaic. There's not very much. Uh, the majority of Daniel is in Aramaic uh, because it was the language of the, the Babylonian Empire. Uh, so it's the daily language for them. Latin uh, was the official language of Rome. Greek was the international language of the empire. So it's the most common because you're dealing with all of the people coming in and out of the empire, no matter the, the country or region you were from, if you could speak Greek, you could interact with anybody in the entire empire. So Pilate creates the sign, King of the Jews. Um, the, the purpose of the sign at the top of the cross, uh, this was very common, it wasn't just Jesus that had it. Uh, it, it listed their specific crimes. So as you walked by and saw the crosses, all the people being crucified, you would know if I commit that crime, this is what happens to me. It was very effective. Uh, in keeping crime low. Uh, they would also leave the bodies there for multiple days uh, after they had died. Sometimes it would take days to die, and then they would just leave them there to rot. Again, if you want to keep people from committing crimes, do stuff like that. Let them know. If you do this, this is what happens to you. We'll crucify you, and we'll leave you uh, to rot. Uh, so this was Jesus' crime. He's king of the Jews. And again, this is John's use of irony. It's true it's not a crime. It's true. He is, in fact, the king of the Jews. He is the eternal king that rules over the eternal kingdom. Daniel chapter 7. Everything comes back to Daniel. Uh, it's what happens when you preach the book of the Bible. Everything comes back to it uh, somehow in some way. Uh, verse 24 is this quote. Uh, they're dividing up his clothes. Uh, but it gets to the tunic, it's one piece, you don't want to divide that into four, so you're going to ruin it. You're just going to have car washing towels at that point. Uh, so they, they cast lots. Uh, they, they roll some dice to see who's going to get it. This was to fulfill the scripture that says. That scripture is from Psalm 22. Uh, it is the most often quoted psalm in the New Testament. And if you read through Psalm 22, you'll see why. It is a prophecy of the crucifixion. And it lays out in shocking detail what will happen to the Messiah when he is crucified. Uh, in fact, there are three specific um, mentions of Psalm 22. Uh, John 19, 28, verse 36, and verse 37. Uh, all come from Psalm 22. I think it's verses 15, 16, and 17. So just three right in a row. Uh, there are these, these allusions to Psalm 22 that this is a fulfillment of what is happening there uh, verse 25, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. Isn't that a sad statement? Uh, you know, we have this picture of um, Jesus being up on this high hill, removed from everybody, being crucified. Um, that's not how the Romans crucified. They crucified just a few inches off the ground. 
It was part of the mental torture of the crucifixion. If you could just reach down a few inches, you would find relief because your feet would find the ground. So when Mary is at the foot of the cross, she's almost eye to eye with her son. She's right there with him. Uh, what a horrific moment uh, for a mom uh, to have to endure something like that. But she's there. She's got people with her, another Mary and another Mary. And uh, Mary's sister, uh, again, scholars debate back and forth who the sister is. Uh, the most uh, popular idea is that it's Salome. Uh, Salome is listed as the mother of James and John, which if that's the case, that means Jesus was related to James and John, two of his disciples, the gospel writer, John. They would be, have been cousins. Uh, verse 26, 27, um, behold your son, to the disciple, behold your mother. You know, the Old Testament commands to honor your parents. This is what Jesus is doing. Um, Mary is uh, most certainly a, a widow at this point because there's no mention of Joseph uh, from Jesus' childhood uh, on. So the, the likelihood is Joseph is, is dead by now uh, for whatever reason. We, don't, we don't, simply don't know that story. Uh, widows had no way of earning income. There's not Social Security. There's not life insurance policies or anything like that. A lot of widows were very, very destitute. It was up to the son to care for the widowed mother. Uh, so Jesus, the son, is on the cross. He cannot care for her, so he's making provision for her, looking to his closest friend, to John. Um, again, it's the disciple whom Jesus loved to care for uh, his mother in his absence. Uh, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Uh, again, this is, John puts the note in there, to fulfill the scripture. That's Psalm 69, 21, uh, that says that the, when the Messiah goes through this, he will thirst. Um, so again, there's yet, yet another fulfillment. Uh, verse 30, um, it is finished. It's over. There is no more work to accomplish. I came and I have done exactly what the Father told me to do in its fullness. Uh, so, you know, we mentioned a little bit last week the, the view that when Jesus died, he went to hell and, like, fought the demons, you know, pulls out a sword or something and, you know, finishes whatever he has to do. Um, th that whole argument breaks down by Jesus' phrase, it is finished. Um, because finished means finished. It, it's, it's over. Uh, that The work is done. And you can look at those verses from Hebrews 9 uh, that refer back to that, that, that speak to that reality that Jesus once and for all accomplish salvation at the cross. It is done. It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Gave up. Uh, a hint at the voluntary nature of Jesus dying. They didn't kill him. He voluntarily gave up his life for the sake of sinners like us. Now, they do give him the drink of the sour wine. That's not to be confused with the wine mixed with myrrh. Uh, the other gospel writers tell us about the wine mixed with myrrh that Jesus refused because that was a sedative. Uh, so that, that, that would just kind of knock you out, you pain-free, and then you, you pain-free go into your death. Jesus refused that while he was on the cross. This was just out of thirst. Uh, so he took the drink. So that, that's not, those are two separate uh, events. Uh, verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation... And so that the bodies would not, be, uh, would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. That's obviously John putting that note in there. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced. 
Oh, so back to verse 31. It's the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath is coming. It's the preparation day for the Sabbath. That's the day before uh, the Sabbath. So you can't work on the Sabbath. So on the preparation day, you get all your work done for Sabbath because you can't do anything on that day. And it's a high day. It's a holy day. It's a holiday uh, because it's the Sabbath of Passover week. Uh, so this, that, that day is a big deal. Um, and they don't want the bodies to be left up because if they would have been left up, the dead bodies would have defiled the land. And on a high holy day, they can't have defilement of any kind in the land. That would break God's law. So they want the bodies taken down and buried. So the only way to do that, to expedite the death of a crucifixion, is to break their legs, uh, which that alone is awful. Um, if you've ever, again, baseball player, uh, baseball bats to the shins, Oh, it's just awful. That's some of the worst pain imaginable. This is this kind of stuff they're doing is they're busting your legs. Um, so the, the way a crucifixion worked, uh, you know, so they're, they're nailing your, your feet uh, to the, the bottom piece of the cross. They're nailing your hands. Likely it's through the, the wrist here, not the hand. That would just rip through in the soft flesh, but here uh, through the wrist where it's going to lock in with your wrist joint. Uh, also through there is your median nerve. Uh, you know this is your funny bone. And when you hit it in your elbow, so just imagine a railroad spike piercing that nerve. Uh, horrific, horrific, screaming uh, kind of pain. And then they lift you up. Now, they've already been beaten, right? He's been flogged. Uh, so this is the, the, the nastiness with the cat of nine tails where the Roman soldiers would beat him. It was guaranteed by the third uh, hit of the cat of nine tails that open flesh uh, would be exposed. Um, so you know, nine strands of leather whip about this long, uh, the end of which were tied iron balls and bits of bone and glass so that the iron balls would soften the flesh, bruise it up, and then the, the bone and the glass would rip uh, th that now softened flesh and simply expose it. Um, most people who were flogged died from the flogging uh, because they would, they would get up from being flogged and their insides fell out their back. Uh, because it, like, there's just nothing there. It's just all been completely ripped off their body. Jesus survives uh, all of this and goes to the cross. Now, once they hang you up, um, gravity takes its effect. You can only hold yourself up so long before your, your muscles get tired, they spasm, and you can't hold yourself up. So the rib cage, as you slouch, begins to push in on your lungs. You can breathe in, but you cannot breathe out. So to take a breath, you have to push yourself up now, your feet are nailed, so you're pushing up on the nail. You're breathing out, breathing in, and then you slouch back down. You can only do that for so long before you suffocate. Uh, you don't have the strength to lift yourself up and take a breath. That's how crucifixion killed you, and sometimes it would take two, three, four days uh, for you to, to lose enough strength to be able to not uh, push yourself up anymore and your back's rubbing against the cross and how awful uh, that must have been. Uh, so if they want to kill you quick, they just break your legs because you can't now push up. And within just a couple of minutes, you're dead because you can't breathe. So it's all over for you. Horrific stress, uh, very torturous. In fact, our word excruciating comes from the cross. It literally means out of the cross. Uh, so it is excruciating. Uh, to have uh, this kind of death. It is the worst kind of death imaginable. This is why the, the Jews thought it was so horrific and they didn't want to participate in any of those things. So they break the legs of the two and they come to Jesus and he's already dead. Um, this is why I think it's so goofy. You know, one of the, the theories of, to explain away the resurrection is you know, Jesus didn't die on the cross, he swooned. Uh, it's called the swoon theory. He passed out. Um, this is an elite Roman unit. They don't get this wrong. They kill every single day of their lives. They've been doing it for decades. They don't miss, oh man, I thought he was dead. No, we, we took him down and he, he was actually fine. You didn't come down from the cross alive. In fact, the, the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, uh, that you can find out a lot about the life of Jesus just by reading Josephus of the Jewish histories, his book Antiquities. Uh, you can see all that in there. Um, he had three friends who were crucified. Uh, somehow he figured out how to get them released from their 
penalty. Three of them were removed. After having been beaten, after having been nailed up to the cross, they were removed from the cross. Two of the three still died because they had already been through so much trauma uh, of the crucifixion itself, they couldn't even survive once they were taken off. So a terrible way to go. They break the legs. They come to Jesus. He's already gone. Um, So they don't break his legs, which is to fulfill the prophecy. Not one of his uh, bones would be broken. Uh, That's Psalm 3420 uh, is the fulfillment there. Um, So to make sure, since they don't break his legs, they take a six-foot spear and jam it up through his ribcage and to his heart. We know that because of what came out. Blood and water come out. So during the trauma of the crucifixion, there's a sac around your heart called the pericardial sac. Uh, With heart trauma, that sac fills with water. They pierce the heart, blood and water flow out his side. Um, So even if he had only passed out from the crucifixion, that was the death blow. They, They killed him in that moment. You don't survive a spear to the heart. It's just not how it works. Again, these are elite Roman killers. They... You don't survive this. Uh, Now, fun little uh, image here, I think, with the blood and the water pouring out the side. So the temple in Jerusalem, um, the the, the priests would sacrifice animals daily, every single day. There's there's animals being sacrificed. Uh, The Day of Atonement, there's thousands and thousands of animals being sacrificed. Uh, So the high priest, these priests are uh, just I mean, imagine the scene of uh, I mean, you deer hunters in the room. You understand the blood that comes out of an animal. A couple thousand of them in one place on the Temple Mount. You're talking hundreds of gallons of blood everywhere. I mean, you're up to your shoulders in dead carcass uh, and all this stuff's being around. And your blood's everywhere. You're covered head to toe. The priests are covered in the blood. Well, what, where does that blood go? I mean, it's in the temple. So do they just leave it there? That, that's, that doesn't work. So in the floor and through the temple were channels built into the floors. So as the blood was uh, pouring out off the, the altars and all of that, it, it didn't just stay on the floor. It ran through the channels in the floor. And uh, you know, to rinse off the altars, and all, they're dumping uh, you know, the special water over the top of it all. And the water and the blood, they're flowing out to these little channels. And they all went out a side area of the temple. So the temple, God's very presence at the, the, the sacrificial days, there's blood mixed with water flowing out the side of the temple. You've got Jesus, God in the flesh. Water mixed with blood flowing out his side. Um, what a beautiful picture of the once and for all sacrifice to forgive the sins of his people. Uh, Verse 37, uh, again, another scripture says, they'll look on him who they have pierced. That's Zechariah 12.10. So if you wanted to to jot that one down again, notice John's theme over and over and over again. It fulfills this, it fulfills this, it fulfills this. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, so he makes a grand re-entrance after chapter three. Way to go, Nicodemus. He, he, it, this is not at night. Uh, this isn't him hiding anymore. He's come out public in his support of Jesus, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So it's the death spices. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Uh, We don't know much about Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, This is really what he's known for, is he borrowed tomb. Jesus was, was buried in this guy's tomb. Uh, he's a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, we know that from Matthew 27. Um, and again, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah 53, 9, uh, that he will uh, be put into a, a place like this uh, from someone who is wealthy. 
Uh, verse 41, he's placed in a garden. You know, gardens play very important roles in the Bible. Uh, the Bible starts with a garden called Eden. Uh, we have this one here. Um, the, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus take place in a garden. The Bible ends with a garden. Revelation 21 and 22 describes a garden city uh, where, called the New Jerusalem that you know, tr there are trees whose fruits for the healing of the nations are everywhere. The, the, the tree of, of life is there uh, back in the garden. So from start to finish, uh, gardens are very, very important places. Now we come to uh, the great text of the resurrection. Verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. First day of the week, this is Sunday, uh, which is important because the, the New Testament church switched the worship day from Saturday to Sunday in honor of the resurrection. That's why you worship on Sunday. Uh, because, so we don't honor the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. We do it 52 Sundays a year by the very active meeting on Sunday uh, because that's the day of resurrection. Uh, verse 2, the other disciple, again, he's, John's referring to himself in the third person. But then I love what John does. Verse 4, both of them are running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> uh, why include that? Unless you're just trying to get at Peter. Uh, hey, yeah, we ran, and he's a slowpoke. I got there first. I beat him. Uh, and now look at uh, verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, he refers to it again that he outran Peter. Apparently Peter is slow and can't quite get it, uh, which is certainly true of Peter. He's slow and doesn't get it. Uh, but John apparently is, is quick and feels the need to include all of that. Chapter 21 we'll look at next week also has a fun interplay between John and Peter uh, as well. Uh, so John's faster. Uh, they look in and they get to the tomb uh, he's not there, and they see the cloths lying there. You know, one of the early theories, and some, some still hold it, uh, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, they just stole the body. Either the Romans stole it, or Jesus' disciples stole it. That was the rumor that the, the Jewish leaders had passed around by the soldiers, just say that they stole it. Uh, these cloths lying there is evidence that the body was not stolen. Because if you steal a body, you're not going to take time to unwrap it. You're, you're going to take it wrapped because that's just gross to unwrap it first, but that's going to take a while. Uh, I mean, there are 70-ish pounds of spices and ointments wrapped in this stuff around him. So this is not a, a small thing to remove this and leave it there. So the body was not stolen. He's, he rose from the dead. Um, so John looks in. Peter goes in, then John joins him. Um, Jewish law required two male witnesses to prove something to be true. And that's now what we have. Mary is the first one to see it. She doesn't count because Mary can't testify in court. She, women could not legally testify there for whatever reason. Sorry, ladies. It's just the way that it was. We've come so far. Um, <laughs> couldn't then... Uh, so the two, again, what has John done? John has created a courtroom. This, this whole motif. Now, we, the, the previous chapter, we've got a third party, Pilate, saying he's innocent. Now you've got two Jewish men declaring that he's innocent. So according to their own law, Jesus did rise from the dead. Uh, verse 11. 
But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. Again, they're in a garden. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So she thinks he's the gardener. She could not identify him. Uh, so that begs the question, why? How did she not know? Now, it could be he has veiled his identity from them. We'll see that um, later. Uh, you, you've got that again with uh, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, Jesus walks with them. They don't know that it's him. So either he's veiling his identity from them or the resurrected body just looks that good, that he looks so different. He's, again, he's not broken and bloodied and disfigured anymore. He's got the, the remnants of the crucifixion, but he's not, you know, this beaten down, bloodied, barely breathing Jewish man anymore. He's got the, the resurrected body. Uh, so it could be that that's just not what they're expecting. They glance, and it's not what they look, they're looking for, and, and they don't know that it's him. It could go either way. Either way, she doesn't know that it's him until he says to her, Mary. She hears his voice, and she knows that it's him, which is, I think, a fulfillment of John chapter 10. Uh, Jesus said, I know my sheep, and they know me. They know my voice. She hears and knows that's my shepherd. Uh, verse 17, go and tell them. This is, uh, yeah, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Uh, interesting how Jesus would phrase all of that. My father's your father. My God's your God. Think now because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, you have the same relationship with the heavenly father that I do. The closeness, the intimacy that is involved between father and son now is true for all believers, which is exactly what Jesus prayed for in chapter 17, wasn't it? May, just as I am in you and you are in me, may they be in us. You now are invited into that relationship that Jesus has with his heavenly father. You can be that close to him because of the work of Jesus. Now, verses 21 and 22 um, are John's version of the Great Commission. It's very short. Uh, you know, Matthew's is the most famous. Go and therefore in all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, John's is far less known uh, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Go. Go into all the world. Go do your thing. Breathe on them. Receive the Holy Spirit, likely a foretaste of the Holy Spirit who's still to come at Pentecost in fullness for them, uh, which, which is why Acts 2 is so incredible because the, the promised Holy Spirit from John 16 finally arrives. Now, verse 23 is a weird one. Uh, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Um, there are church groups, namely the Roman Catholics, who pull that verse and say this is what gives the church authority to forgive sins. 
Uh, we get to declare if you're forgiven or not. We get to declare if you are not forgiven. This is why you have to come to us and we'll give you the Hail Marys. We'll give you the Our Fathers. We'll tell you how much money you have to give, uh, all of that, because you have to come to us to be forgiven. Jesus gave the church authority to do so. That is not at all what John is teaching us, what Jesus means when he says this. Again, grammar matters. Okay, grammar matters. Uh, the, the word for forgive and the word for withhold are perfect tense verbs, meaning they should be translated have been or has been. It's a past action that has present results. So what he's teaching is um, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they've already been forgiven. If you withhold that, it's already been withheld. So he's not endorsing the church with authority to forgive sins and determine someone's salvation. He's endorsing the gospel message. You're going to take the truth of the gospel to the world, and you're going to declare to them that in Jesus your sins can be forgiven, and that is true because God has already declared that that's the case. You're going to declare that if you don't trust in Jesus, forgiveness is withheld from you, and you stand condemned by God himself, and that is true because God has already declared this has happened, and if you trust in my son, you are forgiven. If you don't, you are condemned. He's simply letting them know um, what you're going to go and say God has already said is true, and God himself endorses the truth of the gospel. Uh, verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin. Old translations call him Didymus. That's the Greek word. It means twin. Was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Poor Thomas. You know, they're there. Jesus has risen from the dead. He appears in this miraculous thing and how great this was. And he talks to them and how glad they were. Uh, up in one of the verses, verse 20, you know, they were glad when they saw the Lord. Of course they were. He's risen from the dead. Well, that's the understatement of the year. And we don't know where Thomas is, but Thomas isn't with them. That's why you need to go to church all the time because you don't know what you're going to miss out on. <laughs> so he's not there. And he misses out on all of this. So they tell him, we saw Jesus. And Thomas, had, he gets a bad rep. I mean, the guy's nickname is Doubting Thomas. That's just mean. You know, one, one little instance here, um, but we understand what he says in verse 25. Unless I see it, unless I touch it, I will never believe. Now, friends, that is reasonable. Like, I get that, and you should too. That is a reasonable response to something so ridiculous because they knew what happened at crucifixion. You don't come back from that. You are dead. So he is, he is giving a reasonable, logical, human-based, earth-based response to this message. There's no way, not a chance. There has to be proof. And if I don't have the proof, I will not believe. Verse 26, eight days later. Poor Thomas. He has to wrestle with this for eight days. This is, so this is next Sunday, because Sunday would have been counted, so th th a whole week. What a horrible week. You've got all of your disciple buddies, they're all smiling. Jesus rose from the dead, they're having a grand old time. Everything's great. And then there's Thomas, who, who doesn't believe, who can't believe, so now he's kind of caught. He's got friends who believe, but he's got this evidence thing that's keeping him from believing and he's caught in the middle of it he's going back and forth and what a mental battle that must have been he's wrestled with all of this and then he's finally he went to church and he didn't miss out so he's there 
Good for you, Thomas. You should do that every week. And he gets there. Jesus comes in. You know, again, both times, although the doors were locked, he comes, he comes in. That doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus was like a ghost and he like floated through the wall. Uh, Jesus, I mean, the, the account is Jesus had a very physical body. Um, in the next chapter, he eats with the disciples. So he's not a ghost, he's, he's physical. Uh, so likely what it means is the, the door miraculously just opened. He didn't float through the wall, or float through the door. It was locked, but it opened, and he walks in. It happens again in the book of Acts with Peter. The, the door just opens. Uh, God, God does that. Um, so, you know, don't think that he's some phantom flying around. It's just not the case. Um, so there he is. Peace be with you, he says. Uh, I imagine that probably would have landed well with Thomas. He's not had any peace for the last week. Um, peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas and addresses him directly. And he does not yell at Thomas for doubting. He doesn't lecture him. Uh, nothing. He simply says, here. You want proof? Here's proof. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's right here. Go ahead. Right there. So you stick your hand in there, uh, which apparently doesn't hurt in the resurrection body to you know, jam your hand in a wound, uh, but it's enough. He, he finally gets it all. Verse 28. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Um, what a statement. Uh, and Jesus doesn't correct him. These are Jews. And he has just declared emphatically, you are God. Now, if that weren't true, what would Jesus have done in this moment? He would have immediately, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no. No, you, no, you can't do, that's blasphemous. Yeah, I just got killed for that. You know, you can't, you can't say that. You can't say that, that someone is God when they're not God. Jesus welcomes the comment because it is true. So of all the evidences that we've seen, all the signs, the discourses, the, the seven absolute I am statements, the seven predicate I am statements, this one is the most emphatic, unarguable statement in the Gospel of John that Jesus is in fact God in the flesh because he says it directly to Jesus and Jesus welcomes it. Now, to those who will say Jesus was just a great moral teacher, um, if that's all he is, he's not, because a great moral teacher would have corrected Thomas in this moment and taught him the right way to respond. But he is indeed God in the flesh. Have you believed because you've seen me? I mean, how great. You, you got the evidence that you needed. You got to see me with your own eyes, touch me with your own hands. What a great experience. Blessed are those, end of 29, who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you. That's me. We have not seen him with our own eyes. We have not touched him with our own hands. We, we don't get the experience that Thomas got. We get his testimony, not his experience. You know, First John uh, will say that which we have seen with our eyes, that which our hands have touched. Um, we, we get their eyewitness firsthand uh, accounts and experiences, but we don't personally get that. Blessed are those. Favored are those. Congratulations to those who have not seen and yet believe. So to see and then believe, that's called Knowledge to not see and then believe, that's called faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, the evidence of things unseen, Hebrews will tell us. Uh, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. Those of you men who come to the Saturday morning Bible study, you will recognize these verses, and I'm sure you've memorized them all by now. 1 Peter 1 is this incredibly long, wonderful flowery description of the salvation that Jesus has provided for us. Here's what he says, chapter 1, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, 
obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You don't see him. You haven't and you won't until he returns or you die. But you love him anyway. You believe anyway. Uh, there is sufficient evidence. Um, your Christianity is not checking your brain at the door. Uh, and anti-intellectual, that's not the case at all. Um, throughout history, uh, some of the smartest men and women on the planet have been faithful followers of Jesus. Uh, some of the, the greatest advances in the world of science and technology and uh, astronomy and all that have been brought about by believers in Jesus. So uh, you know, the, the faith is not anti-intellectual, um, but at some point, the knowledge comes to an end and faith must begin at some point um, because we don't have a video recording of him coming out of the tomb. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't have that. We, we have faith. Hebrews says without faith, it's impossible to please God. At the end of chapter 20, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So he restates the themes of the gospel. The identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, signs. He did a lot more. John included seven. Uh, and then the resurrection, that's kind of the ultimate sign there. But he includes all of these signs. Uh, he did a whole bunch more, but I didn't write them down. The ones I chose, these are written for a specific purpose so that you would believe that Jesus really is who he said he was and that by believing you would have life. The purpose of the Gospel of John is that you will respond to Jesus the way that Thomas just did. This is why John is the only one to include this from Thomas, because it serves his purpose. He just gave you a flesh and blood example of what he wants everyone who reads his gospel to do. He wants you to see the evidence that's been presented, to fall to your knees before the Lord and declare, my Lord and my God. That's the whole point of the book. Now, there's, there's a bit more to go in chapter 21, and we'll look at that next week. Uh, but that's kind of a, a fitting place to con conclude our time uh, tonight that this is why we've spent the last 15 weeks walking through this book slowly but surely so that you would see the evidence and so that you would fall before him and declare this is who you are. You are my Lord and you are my God. So typically we spend a couple of minutes here at the end and we talk about some application. It, it, it's kind of tough to do with... Um, Stories, like the historical accounts uh, of all of this, but I, I think there's uh, at least some, some things for us to take away. Um, have you come to a point where you have examined the evidence? Nobody's asking you to do this blindly. No one. God is not asking you to do this blindly. H have you come to a point where you have, have researched your questions and gotten correct biblical answers to them and come to the right conclusions. Um, I, for, for some reason, there are people who will hold on to questions that they have about faith for decades, and then they wonder why tough times come and their faith falters a little bit. Um, you don't have to do that. If there's something that you've got uh, concerns about, whether it's you know, evidences for the resurrection and you know, I had a professor in college who said this and there's no way it could be true or, or I just think about it and it just seems so outlandish. Um, you, you need to research that. Um, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the most documented event in human history. Um, profound evidences that you don't even have to look into the Bible to find. They're everywhere. Um, so you need to do that. Do you have questions about the reliability of the Bible? Man, it's, you know, this thing's you know, so big, it's written by all these people, and you know, the, the possibility of being fabricated or passed down to us, 
so you know, mistake-ridden that we can't trust the copy of the Bible that we had, that maybe the original one was great, but we've got copies of copies of copies of copies, and there's just no way that's accurate anymore, so we can't trust that uh, we, when we pick up a, the Bible to read it, that it's trustworthy. You need to research that. It's a field called biblical criticism. Um, you know, let me know. I'll be happy to recommend a couple of books to you uh, about all of that. We, you can find the evidence. You can come to a place of confidence uh, in uh, the scriptures and what it, whatever it might be. So if you've got some doubts, if you've got some, which are normal, they're normal. Don't be afraid of them. Um, I, I get a, a lot specifically of, of young believers um, and, and all of them have essentially the same story. Um, they grew up in church, went off to college, um, did their own thing for a while, they've come back into the church, they're getting married, they're having kids, uh, you know, they're, they're figuring out adulthood, and all of a sudden they've come to the point of realizing, I'm not sure I believe this. Uh, I believe it because my parents did, grandma did, whatever it might be. I, I go to church because I've always gone to church. I, don't, I, really, don't, I really don't know anything different. Um, I, I don't know if I really think this is true. And, and these young adults will come and they'll sit in my office and they're devastated um, because I mean, it feels like their foundation is crumbling. Uh, and for some of them, it might meet. It, it might actually be crumbling. Uh, but for most of them, it's not. Uh, they come to a place where they are, for the first time, acknowledging real doubt. They're scared of it. They don't know how to respond to it. The, the church has, is not necessarily known, you know, broad church, not just Broadway, the church is necessarily known for nurturing doubt and helping doubting believers. It kind of known for stiff arming and saying, "Well, you should you know, just believe and be done with it, um, and it's over." That, that's just not, that's not how it works, right? That's that's not how it works. Um, and instead of coming alongside and saying, "Let's answer your your tough questions," let's look to some of the most brilliant minds in human history and see how they have dealt with this. Um, Goodness gracious, it, it's everywhere. Then we, let's talk about how God talks about this and deals, deals with all this. Uh, so one of the things I will say to, to people when they're in my office having this conversation with me is this could be for you the greatest season of your life because your faith is becoming real for you for the very first time. You are owning your faith for the very first time. What you're enduring right now could revolutionize who you are and where you're headed in your life. Don't be scared of this embrace this and walk confidently headfirst into it because if it's true God will lead you into that truth if it's not why bother let it drop and go do your thing um, but because this is true we have ultimate confidence that we're all good and it's okay to, to question God is not intimidated or insecure by your questions so if you have them ask them uh, whether that be to me out loud to you, to someone you respect, um, there are answers for all questions, um, and we'll get this figured out together. So if you are like Thomas early on, that's okay. Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas. Uh, he welcomes the questions. He welcomes uh, the offer of, of evidence. Um, so have you, have you come to a place where you are comfortable with the fact that um, I have never seen him, I have never touched him, and he is as real to me as anything else. Um, there's, there are believers who can't say that. Again, church is a habit. Um, for them, reading a Bible is a habit if they do it. Um, morals are just part of you know, conservative Midwest. Uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just part of culture uh, in, in some places. Um, but they would, they would never put their faith in those terms. That, yeah, I haven't seen him. Yeah, I, haven't I don't care. Uh, he's as real to me as this is right here in front of my face uh, because I have faith. Um, yeah, I, I don't have all the knowledge uh, that's there to have. That's okay. Faith makes up for all of it. Faith covers all of it. Because if you didn't have any faith, you're not saved and you can't please God anyway. Um, so you, you have to come to that place of comfort uh, with all of that. And then with uh, all of these, uh, you know, this historical narrative, all these uh, accounts, these 17 accounts of uh, the betrayal, arrest, trials, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, um, 
That is the historical content of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why this information is so critical uh, to our faith. That's why it's so important um, that we would, would know it well and understand it well. Uh, because in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, when Paul passes on the truth of the gospel, that which is of first importance, he says, uh, to the church in Corinth, and he lays out the facts of the gospel, the facts that he lays out are what we just looked at. That Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to all these people. Those are the facts of the gospel. And the implications of those facts are life transforming. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time together. Thank you for these beautiful, wonderful truths. We are in awe that Jesus would do something like this for us, that you orchestrate things like this on behalf of sinners like us. Um, thank you for the incredible gift of the truth of the gospel. We stand on the foundation of that truth. And for those who uh, have doubts, who have not honestly voiced them and uh, keep them hidden and secret, they've grown even more powerful in their life. Y you don't want us to live that way. Um, so give them the courage to start asking some questions and saying some honest things uh, about the, whatever it is they're struggling with in regards to the faith or the legitimacy of it or the evidences for whatever it may be uh, because this is true. Jesus is truth. Your word is truth. Therefore, uh, we can poke at it. We can dig into it confident that because it is truth, it will ultimately deliver on its truth into our lives. So thank you for the privilege of doing that, that we are free to ask those questions, uh, to doubt some things that uh, we've just accepted, either from culture or from family or from background, uh, but you call us to learn and to adhere to by faith. So help us to do that, please. Thank you for the, the beauty of the gospel that saves Romans 1 says the power of God that saves uh, and we've experienced that so many of us in this room and for those that haven't may they come tonight face to face with the facts of the gospel because you died and you were buried and you rose from the dead and we all have to face those facts and deal with whatever implications that would bring into our lives for those who do not know you help them to see what those implications are in the name of Jesus we pray Amen.